Thank you, thank you. Yes, Dasein or Dasein, depending on which German you ask. Um, it's either great branding or terrible branding. Um, so those of you who are in my workshop yesterday are probably semi-familiar with uh, some of this stuff. Um, and we'll talk about some of the same things, but I want to expand uh, what we did a couple days ago a lot further. Um, so just a, a quick bit about me. My name is Thomas Wendt. I'm an independent design strategy and research consultant based in New York City. Um, so this kind of convoluted title uh, essentially means that I mostly work on very early uh, kind of white space uh, problem finding research with clients. Uh, and I do a lot of corporate training and teaching as well. So human-centered design, design thinking training, research methods, all of that stuff. Um, and as Brad mentioned, I recently wrote a book uh, that was about two years of, of blood, sweat, and tears and all of that good stuff. Um, and the book is the, the same title as the talk here. Um, so that word Dasein um, is a German word uh, that was used within a tradition, a philosophical tradition uh, called phenomenology. Um, and if you're not familiar with phenomenology, we'll, we'll talk about it a lot in this presentation, but I think it's one of those topics that's crazy important for designers, I would argue just as important as psychology, anthropology, sociology. Um, and what it does, what phenomenology tries to do is sort of ex examine what experience means. So what does it mean for a human to experience something? Um, and I've always been interested in this. Uh, this has always been kind of a, a, a key thing that I, you know, studied in college and kind of kept up after and all of that. And then I started working within experience design and the design of experiences and grappling with those issues of like, what does UX mean? What does it mean to design an experience? Can we actually design an experience? Uh, and then a few years ago, I kind of thought, we have this field that's sort of still emerging and trying to define itself. And then we have hundreds of years of philosophy dealing with both these kind of big lofty questions of what it means to experience down to what does it mean to experience, you know, drinking out of a cup and simple things like that. Uh, and nobody had really merged them together yet. No one that I found, um, a couple of academics in a very loose sense have, but um, nobody really had a sustained effort with using phenomenology and uh, philosophical traditions as a way to understand what does it mean to design experiences. Um, so that's essentially what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, I kind of love that Brad opened up the conference this morning by talking about learning how to learn, uh, because I think that kind of defines my uh, entire career path and life in general. Um, like I mentioned, I spent two years working on this book. I still don't know anything about it. I'm still just sort of playing with stuff. Um, so this is really going to be kind of an, an exploration into that area. Um, I should mention too, the links up here are links to like the main book website and the Amazon link. I still have probably about 12 or 13 copies that I brought with me to give away. Um, so if we conclude this session and you're like, oh, this is actually kind of interesting, maybe I want to read this, uh, come talk to me and I'll give you a free copy. Um, I'm self-published, so I can do that kind of stuff. It's one of the perks. The cons, of course, are now that I'm a... I'm a book marketer, which I don't really know what that means. Um, so talking about phenomenology first, it's a, I, I realize it's, it's sort of an esoteric topic in a certain sense. It's a, it's a weird sort of long, unfamiliar, multi-syllable word. Um, but like I mentioned before, if we kind of boil it down to its details, all it really means is the study of experience. So phenomenologists are concerned with articulating what experience means on kind of a day-to-day -day basis. So, there's a lot of nuance, of course, in it within any kind of intellectual tradition, but I'm going to do the field a massive disservice uh, for the sake of time and summarize it on uh, just a couple of slides. So the study of human experience, it, it began with very large questions like, what is existence? What does it mean to be um, in its, its kind of early roots? It eventually evolved to start talking about what does it mean to interact with and experience specific technological objects? So a lot of people have, have argued that some of the early uh, theorists within phenomenology were some of the first, if not the first, within Western philosophy to really take technology seriously um, as uh, an area of focus. 
Um, so all about human experience. And one of the things that it, it really posits and it really, really tries to hit home is that any experience, no matter what it is, is shaped by a use context, right? So the context of use shapes the entire experience. We're really familiar with this within uh, interaction design communities and experience design communities, right? We talk about this all the time, how context matters. Um, and we can see it in really simple mundane examples. Right, this image would be very, very different if this woman was on a subway or at home on our couch, right? But no, she's kind of floating around in the ocean or whatever, reading a book. Um, so it, it tries to get at this role of experience. And then the third aspect that I just wanna introduce right now is that the way that we use technology and the things that we interact with every day shape both ourselves and how we kind of think of ourselves uh, and also the world around us. So there's kind of this constant reciprocal relationship between the human, the environment, and the individual objects in that environment, if that makes sense. Um, so technology, the phenomenology has really argued that technology really affects us on a, a very pure, kind of mundane day-to-day -day level. So the chairs that you're sitting in right now are mediating your experience, right? It'd be totally different if you were kneeling or lying on the floor or standing up. Um, also on a systems level and an evolutionary level, right? We've evolved to where we've got today because of tools, because of objects, for how we adapt certain things. So to get into it a little bit deeper, um, I wanna talk about a guy, this good looking guy here, named Martin Heidegger. Um, Heidegger was uh, very much concerned, especially later in his career, with how people interact with technology and how that interaction really shapes our conception of, of reality and kind of day-to-day -day be being. Um, he broke from his teacher. Uh, his teacher was named Edmund Husserl, who was kind of the, I guess, the father of phenomenology, um, because Heidegger really wanted to argue for this word Dasein, right, that was in the title of this presentation and the book. And what Dasein translates to in, Engl in English is, if you literally translate it, it means being there or their being. So what he was trying to get at with this is kind of arguing against many, many other trends within Western philosophy um, that come from Plato and come from Rene Descartes, which really posit you know, the difference between the mind and the body, the I think, therefore I am uh, phrase that we're probably all familiar with that kind of puts the mind at this very executive function and the body at this very executional kind of dumb bag of meat that does whatever the mind tells it to do, um, which is actually what a lot of artificial intelligence, that's the model they're still unfortunately based on. Um, Heidegger wanted to argue that the mind and the body are not separate at all, but they're intimately intertwined. So this has a ton of implications for design. I think one of the, probably the most prominent one is the interrelation with, within thinking and making or thinking and designing. Um, or things like thinking and sketching, right? We sketch because it helps us think. We diagram because it helps us think. It's process driven, it's not necessarily product driven. And we'll, we'll get into that a little bit more later. Um, so when Heidegger talks about Dasein, um, he really wants to hit home that humans and their environment are not necessarily separate. Um, we don't necessarily act upon the world as if it's something out there, something external to us, but rather that the human and the world are inherently connected through action. So the things that we do connect us as humans to the, the supposed external world, right? So Dasein, in a certain sense, loses itself within action, but also has this sort of self-reflective tone to it. Much in the same way, I think, that a musician will lose herself in a moment, right? When she's playing an instrument, when she's singing uh, the song, completely loses herself. This is the moment of flow, right? That other presenters have talked about, but also still reflects on her practice. Um, this is Joanna Newsom, by the way. If you haven't heard her music, it's absolutely gorgeous. Or it's kind of a love it or hate it thing. You might actually hate her voice, but I, uh, I would encourage you to take a look. So another way to state this, um, by a couple of researchers, uh, Turner, Turner, and, and Carroll stated, quote, Heidegger holds that human beings and their world are not two distinct entities, but only one which results from Dasein's involvement in the world, so action. Heidegger characterizes everyday life as being an engaged, absorbed involvement in an undifferentiated world. 
So Heidegger sort of rejected these kind of purely theoretical formulations um, of mind and body, self and world, and asserted that our understanding of the world is based on how we use objects. Um, or as Hubert Dreyfus explains, um, if you're not familiar with Hubert Dreyfus, he was a uh, philosopher at MIT in the 60s when they were working very heavily on early artificial intelligence. Um, and he kind of came into the computer science department and like called bullshit on everything that they were doing. Um, he's a really crazy guy, um, but really interesting. So Dreyfus says, quote, to understand a hammer, for example, this is always the example for whatever reason, a hammer. To understand a hammer, for example, does not mean to know that hammers have such and such properties and that they are used for certain purposes or that in order to hammer one follows a certain procedure. In other words, Understanding a hammer at its most primordial means knowing how to hammer. In other words, what he's saying here is that Heidegger wanted to understand how we come to know the world through active engagement rather than theoretical speculation. Hence, our understanding of objects is not necessarily what they are, but rather what they do. So if we wanted to explain what a hammer is to someone who had never heard of it before and never seen one, we might say that it's made of a shaft of wood and has a metal end with kind of a blunt side and a, a curved hook side, right? But that explains its material properties. That person will probably not actually understand a hammer until he or she actually picks it up and puts a nail on a piece of wood and pounds a nail in, right? Or picks up the hammer and whatever, hits somebody with it, whatever you do with a hammer. So this need to do something, this need to perform action is what really brings understanding uh, for someone like Heidegger. The other side of Heidegger, uh, especially later in his career, was that he was, um, he's often classified as, as pretty technophobic. Um, he had a lot of anxiety around technology. Um, later in his career, he wrote uh, an essay called uh, The Question Concerning Technology, which is really all kind of about his his apprehension and, and sort of panic around industrial machines. Um, so especially on the topic of how technology changes our relationship to the world around us. Um, one of his more famous concepts is what's commonly translated as the standing reserve or what we might call the resource well. Or the idea that modern technology frames the world as this well of resources or this kind of empty material that's constantly at our disposal. For any given need, we simply reach into this well and kind of grab a handful of pure fulfillment in a certain sense. And this attitude is problematic for Heidegger because it orders the world as this, this weird sort of pure substance, as opposed to recognizing the inherent otherness of technology, thus extending the ego outward in this sort of narcissistic grasping motion, right? And I think Uber is a great example of that. And I, from what I hear, Uber is, is new to Portland. Um, Uber kind of functions on this way, right? We have this mass of drivers around that are constantly at our disposal and all we need to do is tap a couple of buttons and bring this resource to us so that we can utilize it and then we're done with it. Um, I think Heidegger recognized that technologies that sort of follow this trend are very um, uh, individually attractive, right? Like I still use Uber. Um, individually attractive but potentially culturally kind of devastating, right? Because if we treat all technology as this formless matter we can use for whatever we want, then it sort of, it gets rid of all of our ethical implications, right? It sort of diffuses the responsibility off of us. Um, so this was, this was Heidegger's thoughts. Um, he didn't really get to expand much on his thoughts on technology because he died before he could do so. Um, but just to go a little bit deeper into it, um, and then we'll return back to technology. So I think our primary interest as people who design and develop you know, products and services is what phenomenology has to say about objects and artifacts. So Heidegger's analysis of tools or equipment, as he called it, um, is sort of a very pragmatic one. Um, he starts from the assumption that all tool use is what he called in order to accomplish something else, right? We exist to accomplish these sort of discrete goals. And technological objects are the means by which we do so. We're very used to this within experience design, right? We're used to thinking about goals and needs and how we move from A to B and accomplish one goal using a tool, right? This, is, this isn't uh, terribly revolutionary. So 
given this uh, within Heidegger's thought, we cannot um, almost never refer to things in pure isolation. Right? Even something as simple as a pencil is wrapped up in a multitude of cultural references, and most importantly for phenomenology, it's conditions of use within the world. It's much more than a piece of graphite surrounded by wood. That is, we might know that a pencil is made of certain materials and has a certain shape, but more importantly, we know how to use that pencil in order to write. Even further, we know that the use value of a pencil is particularly suited for when the writer seeks a lack of permanence. Right? So this meaning of the thing sort of expand, expands way beyond the, the thing itself. So in, in his core text earlier, sorry, earlier in his career um, called Being in Time, Heidegger introduces a model for how we might understand our interaction with objects. Um, the German terms that he uses don't really have a good English equivalent, um, but are commonly translated as presence at hand and readiness to hand. So presence at hand is the relationship that we might say um, is a, a relationship to an object based on this theoretical knowledge or scientific observation. It's a relationship to an object that's not currently in use, a state that can be broken down into discrete facts, decontextualized as an object of examination, and analyzed according to its existence outside the relationship to one who uses it. So within digital design, we might think of something like a wireframe as a type of present at hand object, right? as it functions as an artifact for communication, but it's for the most part detached from the one who might use it. Right, these are representations, these are sort of symbols. The other category that he talks a lot about, um, readiness to hand, is the relationship between an object and a user that's based on active engagement. So it's predicated on the object in use to accomplish some kind of an end goal. In this interaction, the user achieves a sense of fluidity, acting through the object as opposed to with it or upon it. The object itself in this mode sort of fades into the background of relations that enable the user to accomplish a task. I think, again, sticking with digital design, we might think of a prototype in it as an example uh, from that world. Right? We can actually do things with it, and if it's designed well, the object itself sort of fades away. Right? Same thing within the musical instrument. If you're fluent in playing a musical instrument, you're kind of playing away, but you're not fully conscious of the instrument itself until something breaks or goes out of tune. <clears throat> so in this sense, an object with which one is not currently engaged simply exists as a present at hand piece of material. But when it's picked up and used, it becomes an embodied instrument. And through that embodiment, we learn the potentials for use. The prototyping testing situation, for example, is an observation of the movement between the present at hand and the ready to hand modes. Here's where I stop for water. So Heidegger referred to this movement between the present at hand and the readiness to hand as varying levels of what he called conspicuousness. While in the ready to hand mode, the object blends into this background of worldly relations, right? It removes itself as an object of focus. When that mode is interrupted or something unexpected happens, it becomes conspicuous again as an object of analysis, as does uh, this woman here, a rider on the New York City subway uh, on the annual no pants subway ride, where groups of people get together, take off their pants, and ride the subway. Um, or a very different interaction when my wife and I got on the subway about two months ago and a guy came on wearing no pants, nothing from the waist down. Like he was wearing work boots and a parka and then just like nude. Um, it was one of those, like, yes, this is why I live in New York moments. Um, so returning back to the, the pencil example from before, it's easy to see how during the act of writing, the pencil itself becomes inconspicuous, right? The writer acts through the pencil in order to write a message, but as soon as the tip of the pencil breaks, it sort of represents itself, right? It becomes conspicuous again as an object in need of a repair. Or when the writer makes an incorrect marking and needs to erase, we switch modes. So he called this mode, um, I'm sorry, Heidegger called dealing with this switching of modes and kind of the anxiety that gets provoked in there, um, he called it coping. So we cope with things that break, right? We cope with poor design. 
We cope with unexpected surprises by creating our own solutions that fit our needs. Even on a more everyday level, we cope with our environment whenever it presents us with challenges, right? We're walking down the sidewalk and we see a big pile of dog crap and we don't want to step in it, so we sort of move our path, right? That's an act of coping. It's something we don't even think about. So technology designers see this all the time, right? Within user testing especially. It's very tempting to think that the end goal of, of designing a technological object is to create something which, with which users can intuitively interact. And I put words that I don't like in air quotes, in case you're wondering. Hence, user testing as a means of identifying the unintuitive features of the object and eliminating them. Right? However, I think there are some problems with this approach. While intuition is important within object relations, to design a, a truly intuitive object would mean to create something that's so embedded within our natural, whatever that means, interactions, that its existence is completely unnoticeable. And I'm not sure if this is possible, and I'm not sure if it's even desirable. A better way, I think, of approaching user testing is through this lens of coping. What we're testing is not whether the product itself can be labeled unusable or usable, intuitive, unintuitive. What we're observing are the various coping strategies users employ, right? Are they ignoring the situation? Are they laughing awkwardly and pretending not to be interested? Are they laughing open with others, right? These are all coping mechanisms. So the area of focus, just to kind of stick with the user testing example, is not necessarily the product itself, but this space in between, um, the space of interaction that opens up between the user and the object. This is the space, I think, where, where this idea of coping happens. The object itself tends to sort of beg our attention, right? But the real focus should be on this, this complex system of engagement that happens between the object and the user. And I think this is kind of the area of new possibilities. So to quote Hubert Dreyfus again, he says, quote, when equipment, or just things, when equipment malfunctions, we discover its unsuitability by the circumspection of dealings with which we use it, and the equipment thereby becomes conspicuous. But for the most normal ways of coping, so that after a moment of being startled and seeing a meaningless object, we shift to a new way of coping and go on. So I want to argue that user testing, when done well, extends beyond the short-term implications of levels of intuition and into coping strategies and what we'll talk about later called creative misuse. So whether testing for usability or doing need finding work or product market fit type of work, there's really no correct way to interact with an object. And the unintentional interactions often tell us more about the intentional ones. So before, or by sort of recognizing the role um, of intention and how we can create things that are sort of solidly fit our embodiments of intention, um, I want to pause to sort of talk about a paradox. Um, and this paradoxical rela relationship between sort of two key concepts in design, the problems and the solutions, right? Um, I think it's kind of inherently problematic to talk about just problems and solutions within design, but that's, a, that's probably a hallway discussion. Um, so if we talk about processes and kind of mindsets and ways that we approach design, we might think of design thinking as something that's been pretty successful in formulate or formalizing a design process that, instead of starting with business goals, concentrates on human-centered processes by which designers, you know, empathize with others, frame problems, ideate solutions, the whole uh, D-School model. It emphasizes this kind of core understanding of problems before we design solutions for it, right? That's all well and good. A somewhat related movement, um, lean user experience, um, or lean design, also highlights this need for proper problem framing upfront um, and an awareness of assumptions before designing solutions. The end goal is to kind of systematically create a product or service that solves a problem for a well-defined group of people. Again, that's all well and good. So I think design thinking and, and Lean UX have been successful in getting designers to think about things like feedback loops and end user sentiment driving design decisions, but there's still a sort of sense of tension in terms of the, the strict linearity when thinking about problems and solutions. And I think if phenomenology has taught us anything, at least so far, it's the importance of this idea of praxis, right? This idea that 
our practice needs to be theory driven in a certain sense. And a lot of the, the processes that we go through within design are not necessarily about end products, right? They're understanding activities. So real world situations in which users interact with objects will tell designers more about a product than an infinite amount of time sort of speculating in the design studio. But there's this weird paradox here. Um, what I've, I've called in the book the, the problem solution paradox, um, and this, is, this has been pointed out by other uh, design theorists, um, Richard Buchanan, Kiesdorst, uh, a couple of other people. Um, the problem solution paradox states that, one, we cannot think about solutions until we understand a problem. And this is easy enough, right? We can't put the cart before the horse. We all sort of know this mantra, I'm sure. But the paradoxical part of it is that it's, I believe, also true that we cannot understand a problem until we think about solutions. So the first part of this statement is easy enough. I think designing solutions for a poorly defined problem space is exactly what a good design process tries to avoid. But moving from problem understanding to solutions assumes that there's a final answer at the end of this understanding phase or this research phase. And once we find it, we'll be able to design solutions without anything changing in the problem space, right? That we could just sort of plug and play back in. It assumes we can understand a problem space before exploring all of the conditions of possibility that it affords. So the second part, I think, allows for exploring these potentialities, but largely ignores the need for upfront exploration. So I think all designers have been caught within this uh, before in some extent. Linear project timelines and budgets often get in the way of these messy design processes that resist this kind of positivist view that humans act with intention and move from product understanding, or I'm sorry, problem understanding to solution generation. Design is a bit more complex than that. And mindsets like lean design have emerged as a reaction against this, this idea of commercial design dualism. Um, so if you've ever worked on a project where you've kind of done upfront research, you've done some problem framing, you start designing stuff and then you realize, oh, there's actually a huge gap in our knowledge. We should really go back and do some more research because we don't know everything that we think we know right now, even though we're supposed to because that's what the project timeline says. And then you have to have that weird, awkward conversation with your project manager that's like, we should go back and do like another two weeks or month worth of research. And he or she says, no, we can't do that because I'll get fired. We'll go over budget and over timeline. This is sort of this paradox at work, right? Exploring solutions opens up new understanding of problems. So I think one way to understand this, this complexity is through um, a guy named Don Ide, who's a philosopher of technology. Um, and he has a theory of multi-stability, what he calls it. So Ide says, quote, technologies do not determine directions in any hard sense. While humans using technologies enter into interactive situations whenever they use even the simplest technology, the possible uses are always ambiguous and multi-stable. So in the book, I use the example of an old bottle that I filled with change and used to hold my bedroom door open. Um, I live in a tenement building in Manhattan, so the floors are kind of like this, and doors never stay open. So in this instance, the identities of these objects evolve. The bottle is not necessarily a bottle anymore. It's a door stopper. The change inside of it is not really currency anymore, because I'm probably not, at least in the near future, going to use it to buy anything. It's just weighted matter. It just gives the bottle weight. So they were designed for completely different uses, but this idea of multi-stability says that emergent behavior and emergent identity are possible, so that the designer intended the bottle to hold really high-priced, Soho juice, um, but now it's been co-opted for this other use, right? Um, and I think this is interesting, especially when talking about things like testing. So interaction with a technological object, in a certain sense, kind of goes both ways. Um, a lot of the, the more modern phenomenological thinkers like to say that we use an object and an object uses us. In this way, to understand a problem space, we need to see the effects of different types of objects and how those new, new additions affect the entire system. So Don Ide goes on to say, a hammer, I told you the hammer was the, the example. A hammer is designed to do certain things, 
to drive nails into a shoemaker's shoe or shingles into my shed or to nail down a floor. But the design cannot prevent a hammer from becoming an objet d'art, a murder weapon, a paperweight, etc. So a designer, I think, has a certain intention when designing an object um, or a service and creates certain affordances to help potential users uh, make this apparent. Right? But the dictation of use is completely impossible. Artifacts are multi-stable multi in that their use is context dependent and the attainment of goals will trump design intention every time. When one needs to prevent a stack of papers from blowing away, a hammer has completely different possibilities versus when that person needs to drive a nail into a piece of wood. Or if one needs to prop up a broken chair, like in this image, a block of wood or a sponge might be fine. So these are the types of things that design researchers like to talk about when they talk about workarounds, right, or solution hacks um, that people use to sort of solve their own problems that they see in their world. So contemporary phenomenological thinkers kind of moving away from Heidegger um, have started to formulate ways to understand the nuances of interaction without an over-reliance on dualist kind of positivist notions of intention, right? I intend for this to happen and I design this thing to help that ha to happen. So I think this is one of the big, biggest insights that phenomenology can offer design. The idea that our relationship with designed objects is both context dependent, embodied, and multi-stable. And therefore, this relationship is mediated by both real solutions that exist in the world and possibilities for new solutions that only exist as pure potentialities. So going back to Don Ide again, um, Ide was largely responsible for rethinking and reframing phenomenology into a more sort of concentrated theory of objects and interactions. He called this new theory, of course, post-phenomenology and showed that this new vision extends much of Heidegger's thinking into completely new fields of study. One of Ide's major contributions um, to this new field was an extension of Heidegger's present at hand and ready to hand modes into what he called, um, he had four of them, we'll concentrate primarily on two, the embodied and the hermeneutic relations. So embodied relations, these are simply modes of interaction with different objects. Embodied relations are those in which an object of use becomes incorporated, quite literally, into the user's body and enables a true ready-to-hand experience. A common example that he uses is a pair of eyeglasses. The user who wears glasses in such a way that they become embodied and remove themselves as objects of analysis. The wearer looks through them in order to see the world, and given that the glasses aren't broken or cracked or smudged, he or she forgets about them completely. I'd argues that in this relationship, the glasses are more of an augmentation to the eyes than an external object. So they have this kind of power to embed themselves into bodily experience. Another type of relations, uh, what he calls hermeneutic relations. Um, and hermeneutics is essentially just the study of interpretation. It's how we interpret texts or signs or TV shows or anything like that. So hermeneutic relations, on the other hand, are classified by their objectness, their being an external object. In this state, the object must be read and interpreted as a completely other entity. Another philosopher of technology named Peter Paul Verbeek uh, in the Netherlands gives the example of a thermostat as a hermeneutic object. The thermostat provides a representation based on things like cultural symbols, language, measuring systems, that the user must interpret in order to make sense of it. We look to objects like thermostats to literally read something about the world and interpret it, hence hermeneutics. So the two types of relations just mentioned, um, the embodied and the hermeneutic, can often be viewed as two very separate and distinct categories, but I think there's this massive sort of detailed space in between. And this is the space, I think, where interactions really happen, if we want to get sort of serious about defining interactions where poles like embodiment and hermeneutics, technology and humans, subjects and objects, begin to start merging together. And I think a useful way to understand this in between space is through James J. Gibson's theory of affordances. Um, you might be familiar with affordance if you've read um, you know, Don Norman's book. Um, Norman really popularized it within design communities, but it comes from an uh, ecological psychologist named James J. Gibson. And Gibson said that Simply put, 
And affordance can be thought of as an, act, an aspect of the animal-environment relationship. So the relationship, in this case, between humans and their environment that communicates a potential action. A common example, one that Norman uses a lot, is a doorknob. Its shape affords grasping and turning in order to open a door. Water affords drinking, chairs afford sitting, pens afford writing, etc. But Gibson saw affordances as much more than just objects in the environment that have these potential uses. He viewed an affordance as essentially sort of the, the connective tissue between the self and the world, which is why I think they're so interesting. Um, Gibson said that, quote, when in use, a tool is a sort of extension of the hand. This is where we get back to embodiment, right? almost an attachment to it, or a part of the user's own body, and thus no longer a part of the environment of the user. But when not in use, a tool is simply a detached object in the environment, graspable and portable to be sure, but nevertheless external to the user. I'm sorry, external to the observer. This capacity to attach something to the body suggests that the boundary between animal and environment is not fixed at the surface of the skin, but can shift. More generally, it suggests that the absolute duality of objective and subjective is false. When we consider the affordances of things, we escape this philosophical dichotomy. So the theory of affordances is sort of a way to resist this urge to categorize human experience in these very restrictive buckets, right, of internal, external, subjective, objective. Instead of thinking only about the self and the world, we could think about this in-between space. Gibson goes on to say, quote, an affordance cuts across the dichotomy of subjective and objective and helps understand its inadequacy. It is equally a fact of the environment and a fact of behavior. It is both physical and psychical, yet neither. An affordance points both ways, to the environment and to the observer. So going back to post-phenomenology, um, post-phenomenology really embraces um, the complexity of this weird in-between space, right? Talking about in-betweenness is kind of like a very academic thing to say, um, but I think there's a lot there. Gibson's theory of affordances has always been of interest for designers, but we haven't really been able to fully realize its effects. I think that post-phenomenology, with its tolerance for complexity and resistance to these simple dichotomies, and focus on technological relations can help us come to terms with the implications of Gibson's ideas. So this in-between space, I think, is where post-phenomenologists have identified what they call mediation. So technology mediates the relationship between humans and their world in a very active sense. It's not that technology shapes behavior, nor is it that behavior shapes technology, but they co-construct one another. Peter Paul Verbeek, to bring him up again, has been very influential in this conversation over the past decade, focusing on rethinking these very linear frameworks of human and technology relations. Verbeek, alluding to another theorist from sociology named Bruno Latour, um, and other theorists involved in uh, what's called actor network theory, asserts that humans are not sovereign within the human technology system. That is to say, it's not that humans are sort of these active agents that use this material around us to accomplish other things. They're simply parts of a larger whole, and each part is equally able to influence others. So the technology that we use has a very active sense of shaping our sense of self and our sense of world. America. So a favorite example over the past couple of decades has been the gun. The National Rifle Association's slogan, guns don't kill people, people kill people, has been very influential in the discourse around the rights to bear arms in the United States, um, as we all know. The slogan is meant to shift responsibility off of the technology and onto the active agent that wields it, but it can be thought of as particularly misleading. Right? The slogan itself essentially says, the gun is not responsible, don't punish the gun, punish the person who used it, which sort of makes sense on a very surface level, a very gut level. So while we might think of the, one, the person with the gun as ultimately responsible, the slogan ignores how the simple act of holding a gun changes someone. A person with a gun is very different than a person without a gun, as evidenced by the way that we refer to that person. Right? We call that person a gunman. A gunman robbed a bank. So I think this linguistic classification, this kind of mushing together of gun and man, 
points to a very particular way of combining these two things. Separate, they're just agent and object, but together this sort of new form of being emerges um, in which the agent is mediated by the technology that incorporates itself quite literally into the body of the user. Um, I bring up the gun example, not really to make a political statement, but just as illustration. I've had one person come up to me after and was like, yeah, I kind of like guns. <sighs> I like guns too, they're cool. So I think we can see some divergence from traditional phenomenology at this point. While someone like Heidegger uh, would conceive of technology as something humans act through in order to accomplish something else, post-phenomenology stresses that the object itself is also has a mediating role. It's, it is not simply that the human agent acts upon the object, but the object acts back upon the agent. Together they literally become something else. Have you guys seen this? I think it's, it's called something like the loneliness bowl. Um, it's big in Japan, of course. Um, but it, it, the idea is that it, it holds your iPhone in the ramen soup bowl and you could like FaceTime with somebody else who's in a different location. You could like have a virtual dinner with someone. Um, so I think post-phenomenology has a lot to offer design thinking. Um, it's very easy for designers to think of their work as this intentional process of creating a set of conditions, including the objects that support those conditions, that increases the potentiality for a certain outcome. Much of this sentiment, I believe, stems from the same sentiment voiced by post-phenomenology, namely that technology mediates this relationship between self and world. In this case, if this is the case, the de de designers are not only creating objects and affordances that allow users to perform an action in order to accomplish a goal. Instead, designers are creating the conditions of possibility for certain outcomes, but should always be sort of aware of these multi-stable and mediating forces of technology. So I want to end with um, one last uh, long but I think important quote um, about technology and users. Uh, this comes from Peter Paul Verbeek. <clears throat> he said, quote, the mediating role of technologies comes about in a complex interplay between technologies and their users. At the very moment human beings use them, artifacts change from mere objects laying around into artifacts for doing something. And this for doing something is determined not entirely by the properties of the technology itself, but also by the way that users handle them. Technologies have no fixed identity. They are defined in their context of use and are always interpreted and appropriated by their users. So I think the designer's end goal, in a certain sense, is to examine how objects in a system change. They shift from these objects laying around to objects for doing something. Design lies, I think, in this act of transitioning objects and systems from simply existing to existing for something. All designerly activity circles around this idea of forness, around instilling purpose and meaning in otherwise meaningless things. So thank you very much. Um, definitely come talk to me after. I am open to comments and critique of all kinds. Um, and if you want a copy of the book, I'm happy to gift that to you. Thanks.